Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Yo. They say art mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my experiences you could trace like a stencil. My guest today is a friend, an incredible chef, serial entrepreneur, and philanthropist, Tim Ma. Tim is the founder and CEO of Lucky Danger Restaurants, the culinary director of Laoban Dumplings, co-founder of the nonprofit Chef Stopping AAPI Hate, along with fellow DC chef Kevin Tien, as well as a culinary consultant for several major projects across the U.S. Tim has had incredible success as a chef and comes from a family of restaurant owners, of whom along with Tim have been honored as part of an ongoing exhibit at the Smithsonian Museum on Transforming the American Table. I caught up with Tim a week after he had the honor of attending the first ever Lunar New Year celebration at the White House, introducing Vice President Kamala Harris and being the first outside chef ever to cook at the Vice President's residence. We had a wide-ranging conversation about building food businesses, launching CBG products, growing up as an Asian-American kid in Arkansas, the trials and tribulations of running a restaurant, and much more. I hope you enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before, and get laser accurate food costs and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmies.com. Tim, welcome to the pod. Hey. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here, man. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling you from uh, the complex where I have several restaurants. Actually, we just opened one yesterday. So um, it's out in Arlington, Virginia, but a lot of my stuff is in D.C. too. Nice, man. Well, yeah, I want to I hear more about that. Obviously, you and I know each other a bit. We've gotten to know each other over the years from Indie Chefs and cooking a little bit together, yeah. hearing you know the stories of you scaling your businesses and things. But maybe for the audience, just give a little background on you know, how you got to where you are today and, and what you're up to now. Yeah, I mean, I have a very non-traditional path to cooking, restaurants, all that. So I was an engineer for a long time. So electrical engineer, I have a master's from Johns Hopkins and an undergrad degree from Georgia Tech in electrical and computer engineering. And I took a very non-traditional path to get to a culinary school at the age of 30. So I went to French Culinary Institute. Um, and you know, at 30, you're already over the hill for chefs. So I, I very quickly got to opening restaurants and I will go into it as we talk more, but I guess have opened over like 15 concepts over the past 13, 14 years, you know, opened and closed a bunch, but still here, still kicking. So tell us about what you're, what you're working on right now. You're in a complex, you said, I mean, what's opening right now? In this complex out in Arlington, Virginia, it's called Pentagon Row, or now it's called West Post, but Lucky Danger, which is like my big project right now, which is this American Chinese takeout that we're looking to scale. Our first brick and mortar is out here just yesterday. Reopened one of my old concepts called Chase the Submarine. My middle son's name is Chase. The middle son never gets anything, so he got the restaurant. And so it was a like a modern sandwich shop that we opened in Vienna, Virginia, way back in like 2015, and then closed, I forgot when, like several years later. And decided to reopen it here in 2023. And so just reopened yesterday. Why sandwiches? Oh, I'm a sucker for sandwiches. You know, there's a really, really good Italian sub shop here in Arlington, Virginia called the Italian store, which has been here as long as I've been here. And really it was to take, like, I love a good Italian sub, but then like I added on like a steak and cheese, marinated mushroom. And it was just a way to do like more interesting sandwiches. Actually, there's a good one. There was a good one in New York. I don't know if it's still there. Number seven sub was a really good kind of like guiding light for this. So Tyler, right? Yeah, yeah. But 
love sandwiches. It did very well when I opened it in the past. And so I decided to do it again here. Sandwiches, typically, you know, I, I have opened a couple sandwich shops myself and we opened one called Make in New York. They're really difficult to get, right? Because you, you have to sort of overseason things. But it's usually like the bread is one of the most important things. Do you have a spec for the bread? What, what are you using for bread? Yeah, it's a pretty important thing. It's actually the most expensive piece of the entire sandwich, right? Yep. And like, you know, we do it where we, we dig out the middle a little bit. So and then kind of like stuff the sandwich. So like you're digging out half of the cost of the sandwich. But yeah, we have a good local purveyor that actually a lot of fine dining restaurants use here. So I guess a soft white roll for most of the sandwiches and then multi-grain for the sliced bread parts. And that's what we have for now. But when I originally opened it, we had like five or six different bread types. So that gets pretty unsustainable after a while. Yeah, especially if you don't use it by the end of the day. And you got to figure out all these bread crumbs and things. Yeah, exactly. Toasted, untoasted, warmed. So in this version of the sandwich shop, it's untoasted. We don't have a kitchen, which is an interesting experiment. So the previous iteration had a full-scale restaurant kitchen, like double-decker convection, grill, flat top, all that stuff. This one is a, it's a jewel box, which is interesting. So there's no hood, no nothing. And um, it's kind of a test to see what we can do in not a real kitchen. So be a fun experiment. You have induction burners and things? One induction burner, everything else is cold or prepped offsite, let's say. Yeah. I'm always curious. I, when I learned that you were an electrical engineer, because I don't know any other chefs that were electrical engineers. Do you have like a special relationship with induction given, you know, <laughs> what you learn in electrical engineering with Faraday's law and all that jazz? I, I do. Obviously fascinated by that stuff. But, you know, cooking, when I got into cooking, I dove in head first and, and tried to take it in for what it was and not cross over. But it's been interesting. Like one of some of the best supporters of mine are like Georgia Tech and Johns Hopkins. Like recently... We got to cook for the vice president and actually got to introduce the vice president as a function of the nonprofit. And when I put that online, the first people to amplify that was Georgia Tech and Johns Hopkins. And for them to like amplify somebody who just essentially discarded their engineering degrees, it was, it was interesting for them to put me on the spotlight as an alumni. So, But it's interesting, yeah, to be an engineer. Some of the things are very good in terms of the, how do you say it, just like, robotic some of this stuff is in cooking but it's also interesting that cooking is like a little bit of an art which is like the exact opposite of what engineering is yeah i was hoping maybe a little later we can we can dig in out of the bit but recently you were at the white house what was that like what was like the most unexpected thing about being there and cooking for the president so it was actually an interesting week it was in honor of lunar new year and myself and my co-founder of the nonprofit kevin tian also another chef here in dc love that guy were invited to the White House for the first ever Lunar New Year celebration. That was with Biden and Dr. Jill Biden. So that was kind of awesome. That was just a celebration in the White House. And to be part of the first ever Lunar New Year celebration was actually just an honor. So we just got there to, to be guests of that. And then four days later, we were invited, me and Kevin, to be actually the first kind of outside chefs to cook within the vice president's residence. So, and that was in honor of Lunar New Year celebration. And then we nervously and so graciously got the honor to introduce the vice president while we were there. So kind of a big honor for us. And we were very just lucky to be part of it. So cool, man. So I got to ask, do they, do they like inspect the food before you serve? Like, how, how does that work? The security, you know, with all the security. I didn't even think about that. The fact that you thought about that was interesting. So when we got there, they have like, in the basement, like this full blown commercial kitchen with like, you know, double decker combis, uh, all this stuff, like a very commercial kitchen. In their house? In, in the basement of the house, in the basement of the vice president's residence. It's not a bad gig, but in the basement there is like this whole operation of naval chefs. And so the naval chefs had to be on site next to us while we were cooking. Interesting. To inspect what we were doing. And then it was a very calculated celebration operation, which was expected but also unexpected right like when they're like you know write a speech to introduce the vice president and they're like here are the five speech writers that you can work with to write it from my two minute bit it was very interesting yeah we were handled the entire night that's awesome man are you gonna go back did they talk about the next one 
there is conversation about us going to cook at the White House next, so we'll see what happens in May. It's amazing, man. Yeah. I bet you didn't think you are going to be there when you were uh, studying about Faraday's Law. <laughs> yeah, I thought, uh, you know, electrical engineer, and like, I went very deep into the DOD as an electrical engineer back in, you know, I graduated in, in 2000, so around 2001, like, it was you know, very hard to get a security clearance. I actually got one, went pretty far deep in. And I thought that would be my path to meeting the president, not cooking. But <laughs> hey, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing I found was really cool that I learned about you was apparently your family was honored by the Smithsonian, was like some sort of ongoing exhibit. What's that all about? Yeah, so I guess I speak about being an engineer and then going into cooking and, and trying to be like, there's no relation, but the, obviously... My family were immigrants that came over from China over the course of like the 60s and 70s. And then like most immigrants, they come here and the thing that they know how to do is cook. So my uncles, my parents all opened restaurants at some period of time, all in the 70s and 80s. And my uncle's restaurant, which was in Yorktown Heights, New York, in the suburbs of New York or the suburbs, suburbs, it's like the suburbs of White Plains or something. I live about... 15 minutes from where your uncle's restaurant in New York town was. It's remained a restaurant all these years. So his restaurant was, I would say, of note during the time. And really, he just took our like home family recipes and he figured out a way to commercialize them into like a, a restaurant environment. And with that, you know, clean cooking in terms of like traditionally Chinese food is perceived as quote unquote dirty. But you know, he cooked without MSG and all these things and uh, very home style. So the restaurant became notable. And I, I'd like to think that he played a role in how Chinese food became what it is in America. And so over time, his restaurant was very notable. He collected all these heirlooms. And then somewhere around 2014 or 15, he started to distribute these heirlooms from the restaurants to family members. And I received some. And I put some of them up in my first restaurant in DC and Smithsonian curators noticed it and asked if it was authentic and kind of the history. And as I started to tell them about the history, they're like, okay, like started to do research on my uncle. And over the course of, I think it was three years with many, many visits to a lot of my family's houses and inspecting all the heirlooms. We had an exhibit open in 2019 in the Smithsonian American History Museum that had our family heirlooms. And, you know, there's a tiny, tiny picture of me and my uncle and kind of the history of what he played in restaurants and Chinese food and, and like, I guess, my role in restaurants here in D.C. And we have a small exhibit there, which is really cool, which is like you walk in, you see Julia Child's Kitchen a picture of Jose Andres, and then like this very tiny picture of us, which is awesome. So when you say an heirloom, what, what's like an example of these heirlooms? Yeah. So my uncle had this thing called Dine and Learn, which was like the beginning pieces of kind of like tasty menu. And so he would have a group of whatever, 15 guests that could reserve and they'd come to the show kitchen, think of like Benny Hanna or something like that. And um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he would take people around the regions of China and cook these dishes and teach them about the food in the regions of China. And it was a very exclusive thing that he did, aside from the restaurant that he also had downstairs. And so this Dining Learn series became like this thing. He only did it like every so often, like once a month or something, but he had like a four-year wait list at one point. So people would like wait years. They would just reserve the, I'll take the next one. And the next one would be like four years down the line, which is kind of unheard of back then. But as a side note, one of the most funny stories that he ever told us was that like Dan Rather's people, like Dan Rather, like the news anchor big time back then, his people called and was like, oh, we keep hearing about this. We, we want to come. And he's like, sure. Like the next date was like two years. And they were like, you know, what the hell? Two years. Like this is Dan Rather. My uncle, who was like, you know, kind of like soup Nazi. <laughs> like, I don't know your friend Dan Rather. And like, I don't, you know, <laughs> this is the next time that he can come. And, you know, you either take it or you don't. They're like, no, it's Dan Rather. And he just like hung up. And then later on, somebody told him who Dan Rather was and squeezed him in. Oh, they got him in? Wow. Yeah, they got him in. But anyway, so like a lot of the artifacts that are in there are like the guest book from the Dine and Learn yeah. is in there. Like some of the old cleavers, some of the ceramics from the restaurants are all in there. There's a bunch of stuff that's are on exhibit, 
but then they they carried a bunch of stuff into the archives which is really cool so my uncle's recipe book with like soy sauce and shit all over it is in the uh, archives which is really really dope that yeah. is so cool man yeah well speaking of your uncle and just generally your family i'd love to you know maybe it's not really a detour but talk a little bit about you growing up in arkansas i heard a story that well among other things, you were probably one of the only Asian families <laughs> in the town that you grew up in. So I, I want to talk a little bit about that and probably some racism that you experienced there. But before that, you know, generally your family had a restaurant as well, right? In Arkansas. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a chef, like a really talented chef that they had, and then he left, right? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just talk a little about that and how that impacted you. It sounded like from what I heard, it had a pretty big impact on you. And I'd love to hear like how that impacted you as a chef, an entrepreneur, and maybe just some backstory, you know, for the audience is it from what I understand, he left, and it had a pretty severe impact on the success of the restaurant, because he was sort of, you know, the anchor yeah. of what was working in the restaurant. So yeah, maybe we could chat a little about that. It was really interesting. And I think a lot of people will have like childhood memories that have a profound effect on their lives, and they just don't even realize it. So like what you're talking about was a very had a very profound effect on the way I navigated my career. So my parents had a restaurant in a very small town. It was the first Chinese restaurant. They had a Chinese chef. I don't know where he came from, but he was very talented. He was great. And when the restaurant opened, it was just like, you know, very new for Arkansas or the town that we were in in Arkansas. And so the restaurant was a success. And my parents were the entrepreneurs and the chef was the chef. And my parents were also working other jobs. My dad worked in the hospital and my mom was teaching at the university and also trying to run this restaurant. So the chef really would held it down, but the chef saw the success of the restaurant and went a, literally across the street and opened the second Chinese restaurant in this town. And like we all know to this day, people will follow the food for the most part. I guess times are changing a little bit, but they follow the food first. And so that's what happened and decimated my parents' restaurant. and. My dad and mom are really good home cooks, but as we all know, like home cooks and professional cooking are like, you know, two different industries. And so my dad tried to get in the kitchen while raising two kids and working at a hospital and trying to learn how to do professional cooking without any formal training just didn't go well. <laughs> it just, you know, it went downhill very quickly and my parents' restaurant ended up closing. They sold it to actually another Chinese chef that ran it for 30 years. And so fast forward to like at 26 years old, I decided that I wanted to open a restaurant. At 30 years old is when I went to culinary school. In those four years, I decided that what happened to my parents would not happen to me. Not that I wanted to become a chef, but that in case my chef left, I would at least know my way around a professional kitchen. Regardless, I think it's a little naive now, but like thinking that, you know, I could at least hold down the fort until the next chef came in. And that is why I went to culinary school, not to become a chef, but to prevent what happened to my parents happening to me. And obviously, as I got into professional cooking, I found that I loved... I didn't grow up cooking at home. I didn't even know how to hold a knife when I got to culinary school. But I did find that I enjoyed professional cooking much more than I enjoyed home cooking. That stays true to this day. And I ended up going down the chef route more so than the entrepreneur route. But now I'm straddling the line of both. But yeah, it, it had a very, very profound effect on my path. Yeah, it sounds like it. And it sounds yeah. like the lesson there for you was make sure that you understand the fundamentals of the type of business you're running, you know? Yeah, for sure. How does it make you think about, you know, employee retention? And uh, obviously you don't want anybody to leave and start a competing business, but does it make you think at all about how could that chef have stayed at the restaurant? What, what would you have done? You know, obviously you're opening a lot of businesses now. You're going to have people running them. Do you think about how to make sure that they stay happy and don't want to leave? Yeah, my attitude's changed over time, I think. And like, you know, I've opened a lot of restaurants, but I've also closed a lot of restaurants. And I've learned every closing is like the most valuable business lesson that you could ever have, right? And what I've learned over time was that like, you think when you start opening restaurants that it's about serving the guest, at least as the entrepreneur, right? As the entrepreneur, you think that you're there to serve the guest. But what I've learned over time, as you grow and open more and more and your footprint 
enlarges is that you're really there as the entrepreneur to serve the staff. And the staff's job is to serve the guests. And that's ever so prevalent now than ever in the past like 14, 15 years that I've been doing this is that my customer is my staff. And so that has been a very hard and valuable lesson to learn over time. And that like, you know, especially as a chef and owner, is that like who you're serving has or who I figured out I'm serving has changed over time. And I think it's more valuable when you figure out who you're serving. And now it's really like that where I'm like, yeah, I interact with guests as the chef, but I'm just like the most important person is the person that works with me. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I can relate so much. Obviously, as, as chefs, we cook, right? So we want to cook and we want to make delicious food. And then you realize, okay, now I, you know, I'm running a business and I have a team that's going to cook. They need to make delicious food. Yeah. And I'm experiencing it even more and more now running a tech company where not only am I not writing the code for this, you know, I need to make sure obviously there's a very clear vision. But to your point, we need to make sure that we're mentoring and empowering and inspiring our team. Yeah. And that there's a clear vision that they believe in that they can go and do. And it's it is a big paradigm shift when you shift from like the doer to the, you know, to the leader. And it's it, a lot yeah. of people don't get there. And it sounds like you're embracing that, which is awesome. I think the moment that I really learned it was like I had five full service upscale dining restaurants spread out across a geographical region of like 20 miles. And in DC, that became like an hour between each one. And what I found out was that when I had one restaurant and I was the chef of just that one restaurant, and I was able to be in there and like, you know, I could, I could make the, the changes to make the experience better for the guests. But when I got to five, I was depending on so many people. Like I didn't have that direct line to the guest anymore because I was just spread out so far that you really are relying on your staff to convey what experience that you want to have. And if you don't have staff members that like buy into that, that are inspired, that are motivated by the right things that like it falls apart very quickly, which it did for me. Yeah. And it's just like a good lesson to learn. And like, you know, it, it was that moment that I was like, yeah, I messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's important that as long as you're learning, you know, but yeah, man, you got, you have a lot going on. You got Lucky Danger, Lao Bond Dumplings, Chef Stopping API Hate, you're doing all these consultings. You just opened up a sandwich shop. I'm going to read a quote that you said, and I want to kind of like get your thought on it. <laughs> okay. You said, professional cooking is consistency, efficiency, cleanliness, and it's all about the process of things. Tim Ma. <laughs> uh, so how are you maintaining consistency and, and controlling quality across all these disparate businesses that you have? Now that you do have so many of them, how do, how do you maintain that consistency? Are there systems or processes or tools that help you? Does the engineering background help? Like, I'd love to hear a little bit about that because it's, it's hard. Yeah, this is where the, I think the engineer started to kick in. Like, again, like post all those restaurants, like, you know, I went dormant for a while because I was just like, what am I doing? You know, there was the consideration to go back to engineering. There is, you know, consideration just to like stay a consultant or just be happy with what I accomplished and move on to the next things. And I think a lot of people come to those terms when they go through something like that. But yeah, the engineering started to kick in. And I think when I said that about like efficiency and cleanliness and all those things, it's just like, I was thinking about more my mind, right? It's just like, if your mind is like cluttered and it's just like unorganized, how are you supposed to be creative when you have a platform that's just all like jumbled? And so over time, I figured out, and again, like being spread out so far. And again, you know, we, over the years, I'm slowly spreading back out just because I know how quickly I spread out before was very damaging for everything. But it's when the engineer started to kick in. It's just like, you know, you can, you know, this is going to be like nerdy as hell, but like you can write like a, a, like a computer program, right? And a computer is great at just doing those things over and over and over because it has code that tells it exactly what to do. And over time, like you can just repeat that code. And so essentially people have done this for years, but you know, you write systems so that everything's exacting and then people are you know, quote unquote, robotically going over this code over and over and over. And that's how you can maintain consistency, whether that's, you know, this is the cleaning thing, or this is, you know, how you build a sandwich, or this is how you, you know, prep your food, or this is how you greet a customer and stuff like that. And look, we're still figuring all of it out. But I think the more you systemize that, and the more that you adhere to that, and then the more that you have to go back and check 
on the adherence to that, right? The, the QA part of it, the more and more this becomes systematic and that's the engineering side of it. But humans are not computer programs. So it's an interesting thing. So as we flip, like Lucky Danger is a great example of that. Like we're trying to roll this out to many places. And the first thing we have to do is like Chinese cooking is such an art. Cooking is an art in general. And like, how do you systemize something like that? And so it's, it's become a problem to solve which is interesting because like my uncle who's you know still alive and lives here in virginia he's like you're not going to be able to do that because you need a chinese chef in every restaurant and that's just not how you expand this why is that what's one of those sort of problems that you can't sort of operationalize how to execute american chinese food the way that you want it's really in building the dish and the wok and, and really it comes down to building the sauce which has become like the most interesting problem to solve and i like if you ever look at a chinese chef cook he has a matrix of sauces and sugar, MSG, salt next to the wok station. And you see this big spoon and the, the chef is dipping into these sauces and building sauce for the hundred some dishes that are on any Chinese menu. And that's an art. That's a like, you know, this chef needs to be doing that over years. That's why like a lot of Chinese chefs are valued when they, you know, cooked more than 10 years because then it becomes second nature to them. How do you systemize that so like a 15 or 16 year old kid can do it because you're not going to be able to to roll this out over like a hundred locations with a hundred Chinese chefs. Like that's just not feasible. And some people have figured that out over time. But if you look at the American Chinese food landscape, there's not a ton of players in it mainly because I think that's a very hard thing to figure out. So what are you doing today to sort of codify that or sort of change the way it works? I know using that big spoon. It's really tough to get the portion control if you're using just the tiniest amount of this type of soy or ginger or whatever. Like, what, what are you doing today to, to codify what is working or change it so that it can work for the 16 year old kid? This is where a chef and engineer kind of like intersected a little bit was okay, like, you know, first off was to get the recipes correct using that big spoon. You're right. Like, it's impossible to like measure exactly over time, like over and over and over. And consistency just goes by the wayside when you're trying to do that with a big spoon. So it was to nail down the recipes and then to like extract out, <laughs> this is real nerdy, but like extract out and find out the common denominators in every sauce and then build mother sauces. Like this is the French cooking, right? French cooking has the five mother sauces that you build all the other sauces off of. So it was to figure out, you know, what are the common denominators of these sauces and how do I build mother sauces, right? So like general so sesame, orange are all kind of the same base and then the aromatics change or the the kind of like quote unquote the thing that flips it sesame orange juice spice are the things that just make those sauces different but the base of it's the same and then it was okay what things can you pull into a mother sauce without jeopardizing the quality because like you know in chinese cooking they're doing it in a specific order right shaoxing doesn't hit the ingredients shaoxing hits the wok and you, that's where you start to get the essence of it. You yeah. know, sesame oil comes at the end. You know, sugar is caramelized in the wok. So I started to like, you know, lay all these things out and build these mother sauces to try and do it without compromising quality, but do it in a way that, again, like I'm thinking um, a kid can do still in a wok or maybe in like a uh, big steel pot or something like that. And so like, how do I like, extract all these things out, put it back together, and then still get the same quality. So it was somewhat of an engineering slash French cooking slash Chinese cooking problem. That sounds fun, though. I mean, if, once you get it right, I mean, you're right. Like, there's all these, you have to cook off the Shaoxing wine if you're going to use that. If you add sugar, you need to caramelize. But I imagine all those things can be sort of reverse engineered, where if you have a base that needs Shaoxing and sugar and things like that, you can cook off the Shaoxing and, you know, and maybe even yep. make it better because you can fortify it with ginger and garlic and strain it off and then you get even like a you know a, a, a net new flavor so it's, it sounds super interesting but not easy it is a fun thing to figure out it wasn't easy at first but i think we are at a, a system that we're happy with today yeah well let's talk a little bit more about lucky danger for you what is american chinese food you know we're in america and we say chinese food which is i'm sure you know not chinese food but what it sounds like you are trying to not necessarily redefine, but take American Chinese food and make it better. So what is American Chinese food to you? I think, and this is like, I go into like deep rabbit holes with this just because it's like the history of it was like very important for my family. But like, you know, American Chinese food wasn't something that was created. It was something that was like morphed into 
based on Chinese food that came over like a long time ago and originated on the West Coast, right? And all the dishes that we see now, or most of the dishes that we see now, minus like something like crab rangoon or something like that, are based on dishes that came over from China, but they were like so polarizing to people because of, you know, foreign flavors, foreign spices, like, you know, Sichuan peppercorn is such a, a weird thing that is very unique to Chinese cooking. But like Kung Pao chicken or General So's are all dishes that were Chinese dishes that morphed into American Chinese dishes. And a lot of that was based in the availability of ingredients in America and then sugar. In general, like the American palate is sweeter. And so to me, American Chinese food is the Americanization of Chinese dishes. And so when we started to look at the landscape of what Chinese food was in America, you have these two separate sides. And it's kind of like when you walk into a Chinese restaurant, you have two different menus, right? And this is what I think is the dichotomy of Chinese food in America is that you have these traditional Chinese dishes that like I grew up eating and that I still enjoy eating that may not be appealing to the American consumer. So there's this other menu that's like, you know, the things that you see in the Chinese takeout on every corner in America, and they're rooted in the same thing and they just took different paths, right? And so Lucky Danger became this exploration of that. And so we kind of took the two sides of the menu and tried to put them together. And I think this is something that will happen over time. There are a, a number of Chinese American chefs around the country that are exploring this was like, what is the next Kung Pao chicken? Right? Like, let's take the dishes that we grew up eating and see how we can quote unquote, like Americanize them or put them closer to like a normalized line of, of what people eat in America. And it's interesting because, you know, some of those flavors will take time for people to get used to, like sour cabbage, like Sichuan peppercorn. So Lucky Danger is trying to ride that line a little bit to see where it can go or introduce the next set of dishes. And I, I just think we're at an inflection point for that. What is it for you? Do you have something in mind of a, or it's something that you're working on that could move that line? There is a Chinese dish where it was, you know, flounder with sour cabbage and chili, which is like just kind of like my go-to that I still order maybe like once a week from, quote unquote, the real Chinese restaurant here in town. But so that was kind of like the jump off point for me because I was like, I don't think you could put this on a Panda Express menu, right? But like, how do you get to that? And so it's a dish that we have tried to figure out how to, to put it into regular rotation, but it's, you know... Even when I do have it on, it's still the lowest seller, but that doesn't mean that's a bad thing, right? It's just another problem to solve. So how do you make it better? You know, the version that I get is actually very inconsistent as well. And so it's like, sometimes it's like super sweet. Sometimes it's very sour. I think we try to figure out, you know, just like any dish in French cooking, you're trying to balance the five different flavors that we can taste, right? So it's like, how do we pull different levers on that dish? to get it to a point where people just order it more. And it's just a hard thing to do because you're relying on feedback. You're relying on sales as a measuring of is it working or not. And it's really just a lot of trial and error over time. And I think we have some runway to figure that out. Yeah. Well, I'm always curious how, not just chefs, but anybody really that's that's innovating thinks about iteration and you know when something feels done. Like, How do you iterate on a dish and how do you collect feedback? And, and when does something feel you know done? for you yeah i mean i guess the the standard answer for that is like these things are never done but i like to think that we can get it to a point where it's never going to compete like general so's chicken is going to be 50 percent of all chinese food sales in america for some time to come but it's like i guess it's really just setting a benchmark and being like okay like <laughs> flounder with sour cabbage has gone from 0.1 to 0.2 percent of sales or you know you measure, like we have all different kinds of metrics now to go off of. The number of thumbs up that you get in Uber Eats when people order it. All these little things, I think, that are ways to measure. I just don't know how to say something's done, right? Do you have sort of a process that you use for how you're sort of iterating? So like you put something on the menu or maybe you don't put it on the menu, but you start to tweak it and you're tasting it. Is that a short process? Is it long? Are you just trying to get it out there as quickly as you can to get feedback? I think all of that is the right answer. So we do monitor feedback just like meticulously, right? So it's always like, it's a weekly thing where we print all the reviews that come out about Lucky Danger over every platform. We actually have an aggregator that does that for us. But then also like, we'll go, like what I just said, we go on Uber Eats and just look at all the thumbs up and thumbs down on every dish. 
and then you monitor sales according to your menu mix. So those are like kind of the three big things. But then we have this like subscription program within Lucky Danger that it's just a monthly subscription. And in that is our playground. So we'll put out dishes that, again, some of them are really, really Chinese. Like, for example, I put out like a cucumber agar salad, which some people got in were like, this is delicious. Some people got it. I was like, what is this plastic in there? I was like, that's actually the agar. Sorry, that's just something that we eat. And so the direct feedback helps, but also like even with the subscription services, we can see, you know, how many people subscribe and how many people unsubscribe, right? Based on the week to week or the month to month meal that we send out. So that's so interesting. So you subscribe and then every week you get different sort of new dishes from Lucky Danger? Yeah. Every month you get a, a new package. And within that package, some things are just like, okay, these are the things that we want you to try and these are the things that like are like the greatest hits type of things. Yeah. It's a fun thing that we do and it's a very small subset of the business that we do, but it's important. Yeah. It's so maybe a silly question, but what are you using to power that subscription for people to, you know, pay on a recurring basis? Table twenty two. Gotcha. And yeah. you mentioned an aggregator that you use to get all those reviews. What was the aggregator? We use bird eye. Gotcha. You know, you started all these disparate businesses, right? That definitely feel somewhat similar. And of course it's the surface level of like You have a a Chinese American background, so there's that thread there. But on top of that, I feel like there's another common thread of why you've launched these businesses because, you know, something I'm I'm also really fascinated about is the idea of executing on ideas because we all have ideas, but very few people actually manifest them into reality, into businesses. And and you've done that many times over. And, you know, we've talked about your background growing up in Arkansas. We talked about the racism you experienced a little bit. I know, you know, there's things like bricks being thrown through your windows. I'm sure sort of spark some sort of catalyst for chef stopping API hate and like that. But is there any sort of common thread that is one of the drivers behind why you keep building all of these businesses? Because it's not easy and you could easily just like pick two, but you keep going. Yeah, it's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of thing where it's like, you know, there's a bad side of me where it's just like, you know, I'm excited by new things, right? So creating something new and concept and business development are very, very fun for me, right? Like I I enjoy that. And so I think that's where you see all these concepts come out of. It's just like, okay, the next one, there's this other side of me that does love the, like the quote before, like the consistency of just doing things over and over and over. You do reach a bandwidth problem at some point. And so like, sometimes I sit in one of my, whatever holes, businesses, whatever you want to call it, or ideas. And I just like to iterate those things. Like the sauce thing with Lucky Danger, right? It's just I sat there and I did that for weeks, right? Where I was just like, okay, how do we get to this point? Or there will be times where like, you know, when I did the Hotel Eaton, it was just like, okay, every day was creating a new concept because there were seven food and beverage concepts within that hotel. And so it's really just all about, you know, scratching the right itches at the right time. And so I think I've figured out some balance of that. There's never balance, but... You know, I think that explains a little bit about what goes on in my head and how I get some of this stuff done. And then again, I've started to figure out now is like I am servicing the staff that is executing these on the ground level and interfacing with the guests. So now it's about doing what we were building, handing it off in a responsible manner and having them execute it. And then for me, then it's just my iterations are checking in on the adherence to that system and opening restaurants. And the food business is a little bit, you know, like an art. There's no formula for it, but there are guidelines that are very similar for each business. And so kind of like now that we have a jump off point, it's much easier to get these things off the ground. Yeah. Well, you also have CPG and some nonprofits. And I'm a huge fan of the book War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. I don't know if you've ever read it, but I've never read it by now. I'll send you a copy. I love it. It's But yeah. it's basically, you know, just getting through that sort of threshold of, yep, you have an idea or you have something you want to do, but sort of getting past that to actually doing and continuing to do, you do that often. And I'm just curious, why do you keep doing this? It's funny. Like, I mean, I just have conversations and I I try and help as many people who are like trying to get started as I can. And the common thread that I see is that like people are just so intimidated by the gap between even the gap between like having a business started and having your plan and all your systems in place and that gap to taking the leap and the risk to get something open is huge for a lot of people. And, and a lot of that's just based on 
you know, what people hear, like the fear of failure that, you know, whatever the metrics are, I don't even know what's real anymore, but like, you know, 60% of restaurants fail or blah, blah, blah. Right. And that's what you hear first, but like, that's always the common thread. So like, for the most part, what I try and do is just like push people out and just be like, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it now. Because when you get to my age, like that energy is not there anymore. And, you know, that's what we did. Like I literally, it was very naive, but I was just like, you know, I bought my first restaurant off Craigslist on a credit card. You know, I signed my <laughs> life away. You know, I had no idea how to receive an order, but it didn't really matter. And like, there's something to say that you almost have to have like no shame either, right? Like people were looking at me and just making fun of me. I had people come to the front door of the restaurant and being like, you have no idea what you're doing. And I was like, you're absolutely right. No idea. But some people would be shamed by that. But I was just like, you know, you're right. But it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to fail. I obviously had some failures, but it doesn't stop me. So I typically just like push people responsibly, right? Don't risk your livelihood like I did. But there's something to say. It's just like, you know, you just have to like dig in and do it and like not be ashamed if you fail because you're going to. And if you don't, then you, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Yeah. There's nothing that makes you more humble than starting, you know, your first business or your second or your third. Yeah. For sure. It's all still very humbling. Like we opened yesterday and I'm still scared out of my mind. You know, you're always fearful that you're going to fail. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll sort of diverge for a minute from the restaurants and talk yep. about Laoban. You yep. rolled out in uh, Whole Foods. Congrats, by the way. It's awesome. Thank you. CPG is funny. It's one of those like very nebulous things. I get questions all the time from chefs like, you know, how do you get started? Where do you find a co-packer? There's so much to learn. And it's such a process of, you know, from, you know, production all the way through distribution and running retailers and the pricing model. I'm curious, you know, before we get into what is Laoban, what do you know today about the CPG world that you wish you knew, like when you first started working on it? <laughs> I think the thing that I take away from it every day is that now I know why food is so expensive, right? Like food is expensive, like from what gets produced or what gets grown to what gets produced to what you buy. The reason it's so expensive is just the way that, you know, CPG works. Some of it necessary, some of it that I may not understand. So I, you know, when you don't understand something, you're just like, that's unnecessary. And so, I, you know, I see the layers now of how food ends up in your refrigerator or your freezer it blows my mind. Like I enjoy what we're doing with Laoban so much just because it's such a learning process. And maybe that's the engineer side. It's just like learning this has been freaking fascinating just because it's it's not restaurants. Yeah. And you're not cooking the food every day. And the person that is cooking it did it a long time ago in a really large batch and you have to control that. CPG is not even about food anymore. You know, I rarely touch the food at this point. When you're sort of talking about why food is so expensive are you referring to sort of the, the logistics of distribution from seed to the next warehouse to the next warehouse to the production facility to the next production facility to the retailer to the other distributor yeah and like distribution and logistics is one side of it and then just like the kind of like sales marketing like kind of like brokerage part of it is a whole nother world there's one thing to say that like so we launched nationally through whole foods right so that means we are, you know, in like 98% of the Whole Foods. So that is a much different launch than like just launching like within your local Whole Foods. And so just to get to that was just, you know, it wasn't just going to the store and being like to the general manager and being like, oh, do you have a local program? Can I get into it? It was, you know, going down to Austin and coordinating a nationwide launch. What was the hardest or most surprising thing about that process of getting into Whole Foods nationally? I'm not really sure. I think one thing that surprised me is how small Whole Foods operates like, which is interesting to me. Even though it's like big, like 500 some stores, that's a lot of grocery stores. They're, I guess, the biggest natural grocer. But, you know, they still operate like a small company in some respects, I guess. And then even like my local Whole Foods, I didn't realize how small the frozen section is. So how competitive it is to get onto shelf. So like, you know, we have three SKUs that will be four soon, which takes up a shelf. But like that real estate is so valuable. So that, that was pretty shocking to me. Yeah. How long did that take? How long was that process when you started, when you decided, you know what, let's go national with Whole Foods. How long of a process was that to get it done? It's funny because we've only been doing CPG since 2021. 
So we're less than two years into this game. So all of it's surprising. Like it's not just Whole yeah. Foods. Like just everywhere that we end up. Like even before Whole Foods, we were eight hundred doors ish, thirty five states, and that was just like kind of like grassroots, like individually selling to each of these markets. And so the speed is all surprising to me. I don't really know when the first conversation. I feel like it was all of twenty one. So not that long ago yeah. was like the first pickup point with Whole Foods. Yeah. So let's say I'm a I'm a restaurant, a restaurant group, or maybe we make our own samjang or we make our own, you know, pasta and we want to sell it to Whole Foods. What advice would you give? You know, our pasta is very scientific. So like we don't even call them recipes, they're formulas, right? So we dialed these formulas in. We had our own tiny production facility, which we still operate to this day, just because like we we have to supplement. We can our co packer can't even produce enough right now. So it was really dialing in that formula so exact and then taking that formula and you give it to somebody else and then you have to work with that person, that co-packer to dial that formula in because what they use and what they do is going to be different. Because again, like, you know, even the switch in the product of what they use, like the pork that we use was a shift. So we spent, oh, to this day, we still go up there like every two weeks to New York. We produce in New York. We still go up every two weeks because we're continually checking that the formula is being adhered to very much like the systems that I talked about in the restaurant and have all that dialed in before you even like start to have that conversation. Because if you can't fulfill an order and you aren't ready, like they're going to replace you quickly. There's, there's so many brands out there. Yeah. It's such a competitive space and it's such a small shelf. But then the other thing is, you know, just don't be shy and kind of like opening a restaurant. No shame, you know, just. Get in front of as many people as you can. Make sure what you're putting in front of people is good, or at least or how you perceive it as good. And then it's, you know, we talk to so many people. And yeah. again, that's why food is so expensive because there's so many people to talk to you about just getting your dumpling on a shelf. Yeah. It's so ironic. I get asked so often from, you know, chefs or restaurant owners, like, you know, how to scale their business from one restaurant to two to three. And I've, I've scaled, you know, a lot in my day. And this is a bit of a shameless plug for my company, me, just because it's a big reason why we, why we built it, but problem scale. And so you say formula, and I think there's a, there's definitely an underestimation of the importance of really dialing in a recipe if you're going to scale it, because if one out of 10 times it's too sweet or it's too salty, or it burns because the oven, you know, the water pressure in your combi is X, Y, Z. All those things matter. And if you scale before you figure that out, it's going to compound those problems. And it seems like there's a really nice correlation or just a, it's analogous to CPG. If you have something that you make, make sure that you know that that thing can be made the same way every single time. Because I'm sure Whole Foods probably is not going to be super stoked about it. A product that tastes different, you know, one week from the next. Yeah, I think that's a very, very solid point because we've seen when a problem has scaled and going back, when you start to talk about big business like Whole Foods or something like that, forgiveness isn't easy. And it's not just the food or the formulas, it's like logistics, right? So it's like you can produce all the food and then if you can't get it to them in time or you don't get it to them, like especially with the frozen product, right? Like if it's not frozen when it gets there, you know, when you do it at a clip of a million dumplings at a time, that's not a cheap problem to solve or an easy problem to solve. Yeah. Well, we're coming up on time soon. So yeah. I'm going to jump around a little bit because there's a couple questions I want to make sure we ask. Just real quick, just so everybody's aware, can we talk a little bit about Chef Stopping AAPI Hate? Mainly, why did you start it and what's the goal? A nonprofit started in 2021 with, with me and Kevin Tian. And it was in response to the anti-Asian incidents and rhetoric that was happening at the time that was very alarming. And it affected like the Asian American community as a whole greatly. And we saw that there were a lot of people trying to do a lot of things to combat it. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was help. And we tried to help through food. And it's something that I think we figured out and using our skill set as chefs and as entrepreneurs, to be honest, to affect change through food. And a lot of that became kind of the business that we're in is using food to make money. So why not use food to raise money? And so we, we did that and just began donating to those on the front lines of fighting anti-Asian hate. And that could be in legislation, that could just be in support for victims, 
And that's how the nonprofit started and started to steamroll. And where's it at today? Yeah. So, I mean, this started in 2021 and it was just, it became, it was just like, a, again, middle of the pandemic, it became a takeout dinner series that we started in DC. And at first it was just five chefs, one dinner. And then me and Kevin were like, well, let's make it bigger. So overnight it became 45 DC chefs and nine dinners. And then we were like, okay, let's go bigger. So it became over a hundred chefs and four cities, New York, Detroit, and San Francisco. And then it went from just like one dinner per city to like, you know, every city was doing four weeks of these to-go dinners and it ended up raising, I guess, like over $150,000. And we just started donating, right? We took that, the money and the proceeds. For one, we, we reimbursed the chefs and restaurants. So that gave them a way to keep their business going. And then we took the rest of the money and donated to these anti-Asian hate nonprofits because they were in need and, you know, funding is such a hard thing. And we continue to do that, not just for the Asian American community, but in response to like our allies. So when the Ukraine war started, Jose and World Central Kitchen went on the front lines in Ukraine to feed the refugees. They actually reached out to us and they're like, you know, hey, this is going on. How can we partner? And like, we're like, simple. We'll collect a bunch of chefs in DC and we're going to do one huge dinner, which we did. And that dinner ended up raising close to a quarter million dollars in one night that was donated to Jose's nonprofit. It's very expensive to feed that many people. You know, even though it's an anti Asian hate nonprofit, we want to make sure that we're supporting our allies because, you know, when we needed the help, our allies were there to support us. Are there any events coming up? We literally just had one. So, when the shootings happened in Monterey Park, we mobilized quickly. So initially, we had a dinner already planned to support Grace Young of James Yeard Foundation for their Support Chinatowns initiative. So we had this dinner planned around Lunar New Year. And then, like, you know, those shootings happened right before Lunar New Year. And immediately, Grace calls us. and was like, I appreciate the support. Pivot and donate this money to the victims, the victims' families. Yeah. And so... We quickly pivoted the dinner and donated that money, some of it to help DC's Chinatown, and then the rest of it to help the families of the victims at Monterey Park. I guess our specialty has been really being able to quickly mobilize when something like this happens so that, you know, as time goes on, you become less effective. So we mobilize so quickly to raise money. And that's just kind of been our specialty and hopefully has created the most impact. Yeah. That's awesome, man. What, I'm going to guess there's going to be a bunch of chefs and restaurant owners that are listening here. What can chefs and restaurant owners do right now to help or to get involved with Chef Stopping API? Really, it's just connecting. Like, If there's something that we can help with or there's something that's like important in your community, like we're here to support just because we have a little bit of infrastructure because we've done this. Or you know, we can provide the model, provide connections. Really, when we announce that we're doing anything, we typically get just like, you know, sponsorship money helps so much. And so a lot of the time, the sponsors will come in and just be like, how can we help? And like, some of it's based on what kind of infrastructure they can help us with. Or sometimes it's just like, you know, just hard cash, because that's what people need sometimes. Yeah, we'll put something in the show notes for sure. One of the things is that like, I do think when your community is affected, and you are a leader in that community. Sometimes chefs are now, unfortunately, unfortunately, looked upon as leaders. Like there is almost a responsibility to step up when something happens in your community like that. And your community can be whatever. It could be the, the one block that you're on where your restaurant is, or, you know, your community as Asian American throughout the United States, whatever it is, I do like always implore people to accept that responsibility that you get with the success on where you're at. Yeah. And so hopefully that inspires people. I love it, man. Couldn't agree more. Well, wrapping up here, a few more fun questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to ask this. I I think I ask myself this all the time, but I also ask any of my other sort of like, you know, friends that are also entrepreneurs or just creators. Uh-huh. If money and time was not a constraint, you didn't have to worry about how much time it would take to create the thing or the product or the business and money was not an object, what would you build today? And that could be something that you do, you know, as part of something that's already existing in one of your businesses or something net new. But, you know, creativity, innovation always is bounded by time and money. If we were outside that box, what would you do today? I think my answer changes 
every period, whatever it is, that period being a year, a decade, a career. But I think that's something that's been like a common thread has always been to like help people in the area that you're in right now. So like, you know, now that I'm much older, right? Like I've spanned like two careers at this point and like over a decade in each career, I'd want to have whatever it is to help people like take that leap that we talked about earlier. I enjoy watching people like do well and succeed or at least chase their dream because that's what I did, right? Like I, and to this day, like my parents will sometimes make me feel bad about it, but like, <laughs> you know, chasing the dream is something that I hope everybody gets to do at some point. And like, I know that some people don't have the means to do so, but like, I think that was something that would be of interest to me is providing a platform for people to be able to chase their dream, whatever that is. But specifically in the industry within the expertise that I've gained or experienced or learned from failures, I'd want to do that. And, you know, you see that in certain organizations today. And I, I think that would be something interesting to me if I had those means. Well, if we just look at pattern recognition, I have a pretty good sense that you're probably going to do that <laughs> at some point anyways. <laughs> Who's the biggest influence in your life? Again, I think that changes over a period of time. Well, I guess piggybacking off the question that we just had, like Grace Young has been a guiding light and inspiration at this point, right? For one, has propelled Chinese cuisine through her cookbooks very positively and like, you know, spreading the awareness of culture and where these things have come from, and then pivoted that towards philanthropy. So I, I truly admire like how she's pivoted and just like thrown all her support to saving our culture and our culture being ingrained in Chinatowns across the United States. Uh, and it sounds like you're already working with her, you know, at least from time to time. Yeah, for sure. Like always in touch with her to be, okay, this is what we're doing. What are you doing? How can we partner? How can we support each other? Yeah. I really love that. And I, I think you asked a question on if I had the means to do it, but I think you could also do it without the means, right? Just in whatever, like we're, we're trying to do it. We spend as much time on the nonprofit as we do in our businesses sometimes. And again, that goes back to that responsibility. Yeah, I, I love that notion too. I think, you know, there's a exercise that the founders of Airbnb did called the 11 star experience. And it always really resonated with me when they were thinking through the product they were building with Airbnb. And it's where this question sort of, you know, almost a, a lot of the genesis for it was they thought through what would an 11 star experience of booking an Airbnb look like, right? You decide where you want to go. A private jet picks you up. There's a parade with elephants uh, upon your arrival. They take you to your favorite restaurant. And, you know, and, and that thought process of if there were no boundaries, what would I do? That usually ends up teasing out the thing that you're probably still going to do. And then you can slowly start to, you know, remove some of those boundaries. And mm. I think, you know, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you'll probably do what you're talking about, you know, much sooner than later. So it's exciting. It's exciting probably. to hear, man. If there was like one ask that you'd want to shout out to your colleagues or your friends or your investors or anybody today. I have found over time that like the people that you surround yourself with should be people that you'd want to be friends with. And there are many times that's not always the case just because of the way business is. But, so obviously, I'd like to shout out everybody that I've partnered with over time just because that's an important thing, especially right now. And then, yeah, for anybody who's ever wanted to know anything about what we've done or any help that we can provide, like just reach out to me. Very cool, man. You know, we're just starting this podcast, but, you know, my goal is to really talk to as many innovators that are shifting the paradigm in the food world or executing at, at a level that helps us move forward as an industry and as people. Is there anybody else you think that we should have on the show that resonates with you? I love that because it's like, you know, I think about impact now, right? Just like my uncle had impact on the industry, or at least in Chinese food. And I think that's where kind of like my head shifting a little bit is like, how do you leave impact after you leave the industry? I think you should talk to Grace Young for sure. Obviously an inspiration to me. I love that that notion of impact. We're around the same age, I think, you know, in our in our forties. Yeah. And we do things for different reasons. And, you know, legacy is sometimes a bad word, but impact isn't. And yeah. I think it's one of the best drivers for doing anything is doing it because you want to impact the people that impacted you, that that, that gave you what you have. And you know, that's what we're trying to do at Mies for the industry that gave me everything that I have and it's clearly what you're trying to do. So the more people that we can learn from that are doing that, the better. Tim. This was awesome. 
We haven't gotten to catch up on a call in a while. Uh, usually yeah, we're well. talking about raising capital or <laughs> some other uh, event, but glad we got to catch up today. And uh, thanks for being on the pod, man. Thanks a lot for having me. That was fun. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmees.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.